the conference, Innovation Cohesion, a new approach to support industrial R&D. My name is Marilyn Fiaschi. I am the CEO of Science Business. Uh, for those who don't know, Science Business is a news service and a communications company with a focus on research and innovation policies. So you'll hear about the CARATS project in just a second, but in a nutshell, uh, the CARATS project started through an Interreg funding and uh, it was originally active in the Baltic Sea region. It exists to support a certain type of SMEs uh, that are called scientific service companies. And these intermediary players are here to bridge a gap between industry on one side, on one side large companies, and research infrastructures and the world of science on the other side. So throughout the various sessions of this conference, well, you'll hear how these intermediary players can potentially bring more cohesion between innovation stakeholders and air a new approach in uh, industrial R&D across Europe. So this conference is going to be threefold. We will first hear about the main achievements of the project. Um, at 11 o'clock, there will be uh, a panel discussion that will bring together high-level representatives from the European Commission and industry, large and small companies, to discuss about the role of industrial R&D in innovation ecosystems. And at 12 o'clock, you are all very welcome to stay around and to participate in an interactive networking session. Um, you are watching this conference on an event platform uh, that, besides looking pretty, uh, has plenty of functionalities. So in each session, there is a Q&A box, and that's where we invite you to, to ask, to, to write down your questions, because throughout the conference, I will take questions from the audience and address them to the speakers. You can also um, navigate a little bit and go in the meeting hub. In the meeting hub, you can connect and chat with other participants in the conference. And if you get lost, if you lose the, the live, which is very unlikely, but still, if you do, just go back to the timeline at the top left corner of your screen. Finally, if you want to tweet, you're very welcome to do so. But if you do, just make sure to tag uh, the Carrots Project and Science Business. The two handles are on the, trap, on the top right corner of the, of the screen. Very good. So with this preamble, uh, it is time to kick off the debate. And it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Uwe Sassenberg. Uwe is the project leader of the, of the CARATS project, and I'd now like to, to welcome him. Uh, Uwe, are you with us? Yeah. Hello, Uwe. Very nice to see you this morning. Uh, you are the project leader of the, the CARATS project that, that has now been running for about uh, two years. So tell us all about the project. Maybe some people in the audience are not yet very familiar with, uh, uh, with, with the project. What is it about? How did it start? Um, we use the Baltic Sea area a little bit as a test bed for uh, new approaches to interact with industry. I'm employed at a large-scale research infrastructure at DAISY in Hamburg, and uh, we try to uh, incorporate in our activities more industry and have more direct research together with industry. Um, so, and uh, the, the main Industry is mainly coming uh, together with universities to large-scale research infrastructures. It's uh, about 20 or 25 percent of all applications uh, that has uh, a link to to industry. But we would like to have more direct contact, so we uh, try to improve that. And uh, uh, the current project is our third project. And what we have learned in the pharma projects is that there are some small companies that are specialized in, um, in services, in uh, research and scientific services for industry. And we tried to support this type of uh, scientific service companies in the project and to improve the interaction 
uh, between large-scale research infrastructures, universities, and scientific service companies and industry. We, we try to find uh, all over Europe this type of companies, but we have found only about 12, 15. <laughs> so, um, and um, what we have learned in the project is that uh, in the beginning, we, we assumed, okay, they're suffering in capital. They need more capital, for example, from the national authorities and for the commission. And what we have learned is, no, they don't need in the, in the beginning phase. So, and, uh, so uh, what uh, the beginners need in this area is knowledge transfer. And that's why we have uh, set up a, a startup school, a specialized startup school, for new founders of this type of companies. And uh, we have formed uh, or we supported forming the Nixon Network that is a collaboration of the uh, scientific service companies in Europe. Uwe, just uh, tell us again in one sentence, what is a scientific service company so that everybody understands? A scientific service company is a specialized com company in providing measurements uh, for industry and at, at, uh, analyzing this, uh, the, the results and uh, prepare the results for, for uh, industrial users. They are private owned, profit oriented. And so they, they are compared to a research technology organization not supported by government. So, and uh, I think that is a uh, really a market approach and uh, it is sustainable. Excellent. Why are we here today, Uwe? We would like to show you a little bit our results. So uh, we would like to improve uh, the interaction with our community. Um, we would like to give you a new view to uh, the possible interaction between industry and universities and large-scale research infrastructures. Um, you will see, I, I think we have done a lot in, in, in a two and a half years. So we have some results to show and uh, Ron von, uh, 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 will show you a, a study about the potential of this type of scientific service companies. So you talk about the findings uh, of the project. Do you want to give, to give us just a quick overview, quick highlights? As I already said, we have learned, okay, they don't need <laughs> venture capital in the beginning. Uh, they need in the beginning only a computer, a lot of contacts and a phone, that's it. So, uh, and knowledge, of course, and um, so, and what we have learned is, okay, uh, in the beginning, if we would like to support new uh, founded scientific service companies, we should transfer knowledge. And what we achieved is that we have gotten some of the successful uh, CEOs uh, and founders of this type of scientific service companies uh, agreed to widespread their knowledge means practically really examples. For example, uh, they have, have opened up their um, a calculation of prices and uh, that has been realistic. Uh, so uh, it has been a special type of a startup school is a, in a very small niche. And what we have learned is also that you don't, you have an, an organic growth in this type of scientific service companies. So you have not um, a lot of uh, synergies inside of this type of companies because the experiments and the advice must be given by people. So, and that means you ha might have, and uh, that we tried to support, you might have synergies in collaboration between the different uh, scientific service companies. And that's the economical basis for forming a network, not only lobbying, but collaboration between the scientific service companies to have syn synergies and to be more effective. Very good. So do you want just to, to describe how does the carrots community 
looks like or Carrot's family looks like today? <laughs> we have every time talked about the indirect family and uh, that's in our case also similar. We have now, I would say, a European network of collaboration between scientific service companies. We have good contacts to research technology organizations in the mixed network, for example, are two research technology organizations, uh, DTI and RISE from Sweden and Denmark. And um, we, we have at the mo or, or we have had many supporters for, for the startup school to widespread the information about the startup school. And uh, among them are some uh, European organizations like IRMA, uh, Science and Business also supported us and uh, the European uh, University Association in the Baltic Sea, the uh, Baltic Sea uh, uh, University uh, collaboration. So we have a lot of contacts and we would like to uh, intensify our um, collaboration in future. We would like to form a European network and we would like to have um, what, what, ha, what we also have seen is that <laughs> um, scientific service companies uh, are active in less innovative countries and we would like to have more um, member states from uh, south and southeast and east that are collaborate with us in the case of scientific service companies to bring forward the the uh, scientific community in, uh, in in their own countries plus to interconnect on the European level this type of scientific service companies and in that manner also interconnect the less innovative countries with uh, the innovative countries at the large scale research infrastructures in Europe. All right, so if um, the, the CARATS project reaches the end of, um, well, it will soon reach it, the end of this funding cycle, so what's next in terms of, uh, of funding or these activities that you just mentioned? I hope we will finance by the Helmholtz Society and three large scale research infrastructures in Germany uh, the startup school in the next year. I hope uh, there are first talks and uh, I'm very optimistic doing that. Uh, we would like to include, of course, the uh, successful founders uh, of scientific service companies. Uh, we have an uh, initiative to form a uh, company of uh, scientific service uh, companies, founders that will give advice and uh, um, teach and coach uh, future founders of, uh, of scientific service companies. And we would like to extend the mixed network. So, and at the end, it's also an experiment. We have two forms of collaboration and network with volunteers. They will collaborate and, and uh, uh, and a collaboration based of, on a business model. And uh, it will be interesting <laughs> who is more effective or are they complementary? Uh, I, I think so, they are complementary. Uwe, in this conference, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. Some of them have been involved in the project, others are external, especially uh, there are some commission officials. What do you want to tell them, to tell the speakers, but also actually the participants in the audience? What do you want to ask them? The, the problem at the moment is that scientific service companies are uh, not visible in Europe. And we would like to improve the visibility uh, via the conference, of course, too. And uh, we would like to, I would say, form an initiative of people that support the idea that uh, scientific service companies might be a puzzle stone uh, of better collaboration between industry and science in future. And after the conference, I will contact some of the participants uh, asking for forming uh, somehow or to, to start a discussion how we might collaborate in the future. 
That's very good. And I also take this opportunity to remind you all that at the end of the conference, there would be a networking session where you will be able to meet some of the Carrots Project representatives in case you want to know more. But Uwe, thank you very much. It's, I think you've set the scene perfectly. So uh, we now uh, look at the, the economic impact of, uh, of these scientific service uh, companies. Uwe, thank you. And uh, I would now uh, like to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, who is going to, um, yeah, to talk about this, this market for scientific service companies. Uh, the Carrot Project uh, have, a few months back, commissioned uh, a study from the Technopolis Group and uh, Ron Decker, who is uh, the project leader EOSC Future at Technopolis, is going to present the findings of this study. Ron, a warm welcome to you, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, uh, thank you for having me. and. Um, just checking if the presentation will start now, the PowerPoint. It will. Go ahead, you can start. Okay. Um, as I said, Uwe said, we, we, we did a study on um, viability and, and the, the potential for, for growth on uh, of these scientific service companies. And um, if, if we can have the next slide with the with the layout, because I cannot see the slides, but that that's okay. Um, can we so, have the slides, please? Here they are. Yes. Go ahead. Ah, great. Thank you. Um, yes, the the next slide, please. So as I said, we, we did a study on this uh, viability and growth opportunities. And I want to address in this uh, 15 minutes, uh, I want to focus on the visibility, the ecosystem and, and the market potential. Uh, yes, next slide. Um, just as an introduction, we, we uh, carried out a survey among these uh, carrots and adjacent uh, companies. In addition, we did interviews and we also did a, a market study. This will be all in the, in the final report. Let's now focus on these three items and start with the visibility on the next slide. So as Uwe said, it, it's difficult to find uh, <clears throat> scientific uh, service companies, but also because they are uh, uh, in, in very different uh, industry codes. So if you try them by to find by sector, that, that's already difficult. And yes, they, they are small companies, young companies. And uh, Marilyn, when you ask for a definition, there are many definitions of scientific service companies or similar uh, ter terminology. So it's not always easy to, to find them. Moreover, they, uh, from, the, from the survey it revealed, they uh, hardly have budgets on, on visibility. Yes, most of them have a website and um, do, do some networking, but being really interactive, for example, in social media is, is less than half. And only one third uh, mentioned that they, are, they have or are working on, on a strategy to improve visibility or do, do the marketing. And also revealing from the interviews that there is ambiguity on the value proposition. Is, is, is it science? Is it industry? Um, for industry, it's, it's important that the, the value proposition and what you get is, is predictable because then you can do a cost-benefit analysis. But given the character of, of the services, which are at the forefront of the technology, it, it is less predictable. And this requires more monitoring, more efforts in explaining what the client wants. So there is this issue on, on the, the position and the visibility. And this also connects to the what, what we call the ecosystem. In the next slide, um, we all know the, the life cycle of, of a company, but the scientific service company typically uh, the startup from university or even the spin out of, uh, of a research in infrastructure or the synchrotron. 
Yes, currently they are small companies and uh, it's for them it's easy to, to reach break even. But as Uwe said, it, it's easy because if you have no activities, you, you have uh, only low costs because you, you don't have the big facilities your own. You, you make use of them, you pay for them when, when you use them. Also, uh, I think relevant is um, almost 90% is, is working together with other partners. This reveals for me the, the connectivity with, within the system. Um, and um, it, it is also benefiting from being in, in such a bigger system with, with the synchrotrons, with the research infrastructures, with, uh, with the TTOs uh, and uh, industry. But it's also important to, 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 get a, to, to get a position in a number of years. And here again, it, it is, what is the niche? Where are the scientific uh, service company? And if, if you take into account that they are in new developments, new technology, then you, you must, develop you must continue to to develop you must uh, evolve and um what we see is especially in the beginning a, a company young company can have a unique position because you start you, you start because you have this uh, unique expertise on on a technology but what if if this technology becomes standardized or uh, even up obsolete, or when there are new technologies, then you must move on and develop as a scientific service company. And this was also revealed by, by uh, two respondents saying, um, we would like to have minor grants to, to catch up with new technology or new tools, uh, preferably without all, the, all this uh, bureaucracy. And another respondent uh, mentioned that they, they, they grow very fast, they develop, but now they reach a stage where they need financial instruments to, to commercialize and, and, and to grow even, even bigger. And um, not in the slide, but also worth mentioning, I think, is yes, there are some barriers on, on getting access to the facilities. Uh, because the, the, the rules of access, they, they can uh, be different, but they may also run into uh, state aid issues. And then, then the, the application process might become very complex. So facilitating standardizing the, the, the rules for access uh, would, uh, would help the scientific uh, service companies, I think. If we then move to the, to the market, we can see, yes, respondents are, are uh, positive. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, um, respondents are positive about market growth, about business opportunity. You can see this uh, from, from, the, from the pie charts, but um, we also, in our study, we, we focused on um, new materials and energy as a promising new market. And here you can see that um, uh, the potential is there also in general, because the, the technical complexity increases and that, that makes, uh, provides room for, for these uh, scientific service companies. And also the e equipment is getting more sophisticated. So you need specialization to, to um, get familiar with this, uh, uh, with this equipment. And um, also we, we, have the, we got the impression companies want to reduce risks. So ideally they, they want to convert fixed costs into variable costs by outsourcing. And you can also see this in the, in the, in the value proposition. Um, we think the market is especially on developing new ideas because the, the, the standardized services can be done by the synchrotrons or, or by, by industry themselves. So it, it is a specific niche uh, where, this, uh, where these uh, scientific service uh, companies are in. And uh, because as I said, 
if it is a standardized service, you, you get strong competition from the TTOs, the research infrastructures themselves offering services or the, or the RTO. Um, so we think uh, uh, governments, uh, European Commission could stimulate um, by setting up joint projects. Uh, joint projects to the, the service companies with the industry with with the research infrastructures there is a lot of potential out there uh, but only limited projects and ideally um, this should lead to longer term relationships between the service company and and the, and the industry and if we then move to the next slide with some recommendations or perhaps points for discussion um, as, as mentioned, uh, support um, to strengthen the position of, of the scientific service companies in this ecosystem. So together with the infrastructures and the industry, and we have seen a number of thematic programs, for example, in Italy, where they have the competence centers, not on geolocation, but on, on thematic issues. In Sweden, the INNOVA programs. And I also want to mention the, the US with the ARPA program. Uh, you probably know DARPA, which is the defense uh, ARPA, uh, but there also was an energy ARPA. It was stopped by the former president. Um, and these programs uh, have a very nice combination of basic fundamental research, applied research, innovation, and even prototyping and, and ready to market products. And each program must contain these three, four components. And this is a nice way for, for seeking cooperation, we think. It is also uh, a way of getting a level playing field. We all know uh, some countries have, uh, are currently technically advanced um, in, in the development. But to catch up, this could be a program in, in the less uh, developed, uh, technical developed uh, member states in, in setting up these programs. As Uwe said, uh, the thresholds for the costs uh, setting up these uh, companies are, are pretty low. Uh, but we have to take away the barriers on, on getting access to the facilities or all the, the, the bureaucratic um, uh, and administrative uh, work. And then with a question mark, what about the platforms? Uh, as we said, the, the visibility is difficult. I think if you want to have a voice in Europe, you must have a single point of contact uh, that goes for, for, for research infrastructures. It also goes for the scientific service companies, especially if they are young and small uh, and, and new to this, uh, to this arena. Um, we also think that networking and coaching uh, uh, platforms uh, could help uh, to, to grow the, the scientific service companies. I think that's in the, in the next presentations. What we see in, in platforms is um, the need for, for trust uh, and, and to reveal quality. You have to take away the uncertainty also on the value proposition. And perhaps a platform can help uh, with, with certification or revealing the quality that there is available. And finally, uh, as I'm the project leader of this EOS Future project, uh, here is my uh, commercial break. Um, yes, we, we are setting up the European Open Science Cloud for science, but later on also for, for society at large and the industry. And the goal is to have a federation of research infrastructures that allows researchers and later industry to, to uh, facilitate and make it more easy to have cross-domain research. So for example, research on energy, research on, on, uh, on COVID, which is not only life sciences and biology, but it's, it's also uh, social sciences and uh, environment sciences. So in this project, we, uh, we aim to realize this EOSC uh, by, by within two years to, to have it up and running and really useful for the researchers. And um, just as a sneak preview, we are planning a, a procurement call end of the year where we will ask for new services to the research communities to be provided by 
service companies. It's um, uh, this call will be, as I said, out by the end of the year. So to conclude, um, yes, improve on the visibility, uh, support this ecosystem by national or even European uh, program, and um, uh, give them a push on, uh, in entering these markets and also help them in uh, uh, getting into the next phase, the next stage. And for, for this, uh, finance might be uh, relevant, but also the, the knowledge uh, sharing in these platforms. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for uh, well giving us a pretty uh, good reality check here. Uh, it's good to, uh, well, not that good, but we need to hear about the challenges that these scientific service companies are facing. And uh, we're to see also what the growth potential is, uh, depending on the support uh, that we receive. So thank you very much, Ron. We will now um, hear about one of the main achievements uh, Recording of, the, in progress. of the project. Um, in fact, um, yeah, Uwe did mention um, this, uh, this, um, th this achievement, and one of them is a new, um, a new European network of scientific service companies. And to understand what this network is about, uh, I'd like to invite the CEOs of two scientific service companies, uh, Anna Stenstam, she is the CEO of CR competence. Uh, and she's joined by Gerd Datsman, the founder and CEO of Datsman Interact and Innovate. And Anna and Gerd will both present us uh, this new network. Anna, Gerd, warm welcome. And I'll give you, uh, I give you both the floor. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Yes, uh, we are very excited and happy to be here, both Gad and me, representing two of the companies in the newly formed network called Mixin, where we are scientific service uh, companies who all of us work with x-rays and neutrons for industry. And the reason we selected to form this network was, yeah, I mean, there were several reasons actually. We are all using these facilities for industries uh, to solve problems for industry and all of us are engaged in helping out so that the workflow between us and the facilities are improved so since we're all engaged in this we decided that it could be a very very good way to speak with one voice towards these facilities and together with the facilities then improve the workflow and the way of working so that we in turn can be better and improve our customer service. We have very many things in common actually. Most importantly, I would say is our strong commitment to our clients and to their problems. We are true problem solvers, all of us. And in order to become a really good problem solver, you have to be quite flexible. You have to follow the data and you have to align yourself to your clients' processes and to the processes of the facilities. And since we are working in such a way between the industry and also the facilities, that makes us very adjustable but that also gives us a lot of insights that could be helpful for both parties and as they are always helpful for ourselves. One very important aspect of how we work is that we are working in a very simple business to business model. This is highly appreciated by our clients. And just to exemplify that, we are now going to listen to Gerd given us two examples of such nice, good uh, case stories from two of our member companies in the network. Yes, uh, thank you, Anna. And uh, as she said, I would like to give you now two examples, two testimonials that will highlight the impact created by scientific service companies. It is an impact on innovation-driven companies in Europe and therefore, it is an impact on our society solving global challenges. The first showcase is from the company Finden, a UK-based scientific service company working with customers from different branches. In that case, British Petrol, a company from the energy sector, 
had a project that was dealing with the topic of turning waste into fuel, such as synthetic diesel or kerosene. This is one alternative approach to produce fuel in a more viable and sustainable way. But when processing waste to fuel, the catalyst is the essential part of the equation for ensuring an efficient chemical process. And the crystalline nanostructure of the catalyst is the most important parameter. Synchrotron X-rays enable to investigate this chemical re reaction in situ under industrial conditions and with highest spatial resolutions on the nanometer scale. And bringing these three capabilities together makes this method a unique tool for the analysis and optimization of such challenges. The company Finden has an in-depth expertise in imaging chemical processes in combination with measuring structural information. And by applying this method at the ERSRF in Grenoble, Finden could identify the optimum crystalline structure for the catalyst in this particular chemical process. And their in situ measurements revealed that there is a sweet spot for the size of the nanocrystallites in the, uh, in the catalyst, not too large and not too small, where the chemical process works most efficient. And in a nutshell, company Finden supported British Petrol on their way to find a more efficient catalytic process. And these findings, of course, have a large impact on the creation of an economically feasible business case for the conversion of waste into synthetic fuel. Now, Excelsus Structural Solution is another company from the Mixon network that is offering powerful synchrotron radiation-based analytical services specifically optimized for industrial applications. Therefore, our second uh, showcase deals with Novartis, a global player in pharmaceutics. They had realized a deviation in their production of a pharmaceutical component and the chemical analysis um, with methods they hosted in their own laboratories did not show clear and distinct results for solving that. So Excelsus Structural Solutions supported Novartis, Novartis on their way to finding the root cause uh, for this deviation. They discussed the topic with Novartis and suggested measurements with X-ray powder diffraction at the Swiss light source. By performing the measurements at the Paul Scherer Institute and interpreting them with their expertise in the field, Excelsus was able to identify the cause for the deviation in the pharmaceutical component. And this information immediately empowered Novartis in understanding the underlying mechanisms that led to this deviation. And in consequence, this facilitated them to change the production process within a very short time frame. It is part of the story and worth mentioning that the CEO of Excelsus Structural Solutions formerly was the responsible beamline scientist at the PSI for this particular instrument. In both showcases, industry could have accessed the large research infrastructures and the highly complex analytical instruments directly on their own. However, we believe that the support from a scientific service company that has an in-depth knowledge on the instruments and the methods is a key success factor for designing and preparing the measurements, as well as interpreting the generated data. I think these two testimonials illustrate very well that scientific service companies are experts in problem solving and support their customer from industry by means of a full service approach. By doing this, they lower the inertia for companies to profit from the unprecedented analytical tools located at the publicly owned research facilities. And as you see, already today, we are 11 organizations that have years of experience in our respective fields. That means that we can refer companies to each other. And when we know each other better, which we will soon, we will be able to take on much larger projects also together. So of course, we want there to be more companies in Mixon and are therefore very, very happy about the startup school that was also organized through Carrots because we believe that it will lead to many good things for us and for our companies that we work for. 
So Mixen is a very important network that we are very proud of. And it is a network within a network. Of course, as we have seen here in the two examples, sometimes synchrotron and neutron facilities is exactly what you need to solve a very important problem. It is exactly that piece of puzzle that is missing. Sometimes you need additional pieces to that puzzle. And then we are not working isolated. We are working with others who are experts in other techniques. And some of us have our own labs and perform wet lab and also perform more method development, adding even further methods to this whole ecosystem. So we fix what needs to be fixed. And this we do in a very wonderful collaborative spirit, working together, trying to see each other and learn from each other. We inspire each other and we compete with each other which spurs us even further. We believe that we can help more industry if we do this together. We believe that we can grow and employ more people if we do this together. And we believe that we can improve the workflows between these advanced large scale resources and the industry if we do this together. So welcome to join us if you are one of us and welcome to interact if you have a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, yeah, thank you very much to the both of you. It's really good to hear about this, um, these case studies and uh, real cases. And Anna, you've mentioned the word together uh, several times. So it brings me back to the title of this conference, Innovation Cohesion. Uh, but thank you. That was uh, one of the um, one of the biggest uh, achievement, I think, of the Carrot project to date. But we are now going to hear about another achievement that you did mention, Anna, the startup school. Uh, so. We'll, I'd like to thank you both, and I will now uh, turn to another uh, representative of the Carrot Project, who is going to uh, to introduce uh, the startup school. Uh, and for this, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth uh, Armstoff. Uh, El Elizabeth Olizi uh, is a project manager for market research, uh, innovation, and technology transfer at Desi in Hamburg. And Lizzie, I hand over to you. Tell us all about the startup school that we've heard about uh, a few times now. Welcome, okay. Lizzie. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, I'm Lizzie Hansdorf. I work on the Carrot Project, and I was part of the team that launched the first ever startup school for scientific service companies. Let me take a moment to tell you the story of the startup school before I hand over to our CEO coaches and two of our students, Solange and Ahmet. Okay. So it all began last year with the need to further extend this emerging market, which you've heard Ron speak about earlier. We wanted to help found new scientific service companies in the European innovation ecosystem. So from March to June, we set up a program um, that helped with knowledge transfer, networking, coaching, and help these new scientific companies to found. We already knew as a team a lot about the business model, the financing solutions available, and we had formed this uh, network of CEOs by the Nixon network that Anna spoke about. So we recruited six CEOs uh, alongside an entrepreneurial e-learning team. And through a European-wide advertising campaign, we attracted 48 applications. And of these 48, we awarded 11 places to the best business ideas. And of these 11, they were PhD students, scientific staff, postdocs. A third of them were women. And they came from countries such as Sweden, Estonia, Switzerland, Germany, and Finland. And all of these uh, students were at different stages of their entrepreneurial journey. And we'll hear a bit more from Salan and Ahmet shortly about their first-hand experiences. So what did we do? In total, we delivered five webinars in entrepreneurial mindset, business model canvas, financial management, marketing, and an additional module in storytelling. 
Each of our students received two one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with their CEO. And at the end of the school, the students had to pitch their business idea to a panel. So exciting stuff. To date, we already have one team that has founded, and this is Armit and Scattering, and we have four more in the pipeline. I think with everybody involved, everybody felt it was a very, it was a great learning experience and students got direct access to CEOs and they learned the top tips on what to do and what not to do. So let's take a quick look at these graduates and um, we're really excited for them and their entrepreneurial journey this year and next year. And we wait in anticipation for the next Carrot Startup School. I'll hand back over to you, Marilyn. Thank you, Thank Lizzie. You. Yeah, excellent. This is, um, well, that sounds very exciting. So it is, uh, uh, we will actually now um, invite two of the coaches that participated in the Startup School and two, two entrepreneurs who benefited uh, from the Startup School um, adventure. So let me introduce our, uh, our four next speakers. It is my pleasure to welcome, to welcome Andrew Bill, uh, the Chief Scientific Officer at Finden. Uh, Solange Sanaya, the CEO of Crispy AI, Bernard Hess, uh, CEO of Exploration, and Hamet Bahadir Yildiz, the CEO of Scattering. Welcome to the four of you. Um, okay, we are in, in, the next, in, the, in the next 20 minutes or so, we want to understand what happened in this startup school and uh, whether it has been a game changer for you too, Solange and Hamet. But before we get to that, uh, Bernard, can I start with you? You were uh, one of the CEO uh, in, the, in the school. So what, um, well, do, what, wh how was it? Tell us about uh, your experience there and uh, what, wh why was this startup school slightly different from any other startup school that you know of? Yes, <clears throat> yes. so for me it felt like Actually, I moved back in time because we received the same questions that we had in mind when we started our company about five years ago. And um, so we could discuss with them and share our insights about how to deal with access to synchrotron or large scale facilities with this administration stuff around forming a company, how to find um, also stuff. And um, I think the most critical insight we discussed was how to how to get customers and how to get the uh, let's say into into new business and how to convince our industries that we are targeting to to work with us because I think that this model of scientific service providers is still as we already heard today is not um, let's say well known by 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 our potential clients and so we have to we had to do some work in introducing ourselves there and. Um, yeah, making us visible and to convince them that they have benefit through us. So what's the value proposition and how to formulate this? And I think that was very, I, I saw like if I had this kind of discussions five years ago, we were, were a bit faster uh, by now. So, but it's still nice that other younger companies um, can, I think, benefit from, from, from our insights there. And also for us, it was very interesting to hear these questions and also great ideas by very in inspiring people, I would say. And um, well, I think the difference to answer your question is, um, I think that we were very specific with, with what we could share and what we could discuss, which is a bit different from, from other startup school, I think. And I think to me, the most amazing outcome of it was that we have Ahmed now here together with Peter, who actually started his company Scatterin and um, this is clearly an, an highlight of this. And actually, I'm quite looking forward to collaborate and work with him in the future. Fantastic. So it's not only a coaching, it's a partnership maybe that, uh, yes. that, has, that was born in the, in the startup school. Andy, can I turn to you? You were also a coach uh, in the startup school. Um, so from your perspective, what were the main aspects of your own experience with Finden that you wanted to share with Solange? Uh, I think that you, you trained her, right? You coached her. Yes, yes, yes. We were lucky to have Solange with her great idea uh, and to work with her on trying to develop it. Um, to, to, to answer your question, I think, you know, as Bernard also kind of highlighted, having this or doing this exercise was very, very beneficial 
uh, not only for us as a refresher to actually what we went through, but then also to point out where we had problems trying to um, get traction, let's say, as a company, and then also able to pass that on to uh, not just Solange and some of the other people we coach, but I think within the wider Carrots community. Uh, so I think there are lots of key issues or lots of questions, of course, that anybody with a startup company has, you know, questions particularly, I think, relevant to Solange was uh, IP, you know, at what point do you need to put into place, you know, intellectual property protection? Is this a key element to starting up a company or is it something that can wait, if you like? And I think that was um, something that, you know, we also had discussions about when we started up. And of course, carrots allows you to put it totally into context. Um, if it doesn't necessarily help to answer that question uh, from our perspective or from Solange's perspective, if you're a startup company, because I think it's very specific to what you're trying to do. But I think that and then the, the wider context of, I think Bernard also touched on this as customers. How do you get customers? How do you start up your company? And you know, revenue streams. These are all things actually when we started up, we didn't really realize, um, well, it's difficult. You have some ideas as to how you think you will generate business, but actually what you often find is, is that there isn't, and in fact, it's important that there isn't you know, one or two mechanisms. In fact, you have to engage quite broadly. So you've got to have very diverse income streams. And as I said, I think a key thing for us was realizing that actually we found sometimes uh, bespoke solutions to this income problem. Um, and I think, you know, a key element or key take home message is if you're quite flexible, and I think that's a good thing about small businesses, they can be flexible and quite agile, able to respond quite quickly. You can often find solutions and hopefully, you know, grow the business. That's good. It raises a number of questions so, uh, and that I have a few questions for you and Bernard, but I'll just uh, hold uh, a little longer before addressing them to you because we'd like now to hear from Solange and Hamid. So uh, you were both um, beneficiaries of the startup program and the startup school program, I should say. And so if you imagine, if you both imagine that in the, in the audience today, you have potential partners and who knows, maybe investors, um, can you present both uh, your company like in some kind of elevator pitch, uh, just explaining what it is about, the solutions you offer, what you're looking for and how you see the future of your companies. You have just uh, two, three minutes to do that. And Solange, I will uh, invite you to start. So I know you have a few slides so we can show them on the screen. And I hand over to you, Solange. Go ahead. Convince us. Hi, <laughs> so I will share. It's only one slide. So okay. It's, it's easy. Uh, um, do you see it? Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. Very fine. Uh, wait, I cannot see it fully. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what's about my company? It's not existing yet, but... Um, our scientific services company is called Crispy AI, and it's in the initial stages of founding. We are mainly based in Switzerland, uh, and one team member is in France. So what is it about? What is the context of our service proposition? We talk about consumers, food consumers. They want healthy food, but it should also taste great. And it can be hard for food companies to provide a satisfying crispy product while meeting an acceptable price, sustainability standards, and reducing food waste. And there is no practical, cheap, and accurate method to measure crispiness during development and production. So we support quality, R&D, and production managers with a measurement method that gives a clear statement for in-out quality checks of food crispiness. How we do that? Um, first, we optimize how food, such as chips, is crushed with a machine to collect uh, the crushing force, like in the mouth, and the audio data, like in the ears of humans. Then we use artificial intelligence to sort the data into crispiness levels um, that predict um, consumer sensations. And this methodology can be also applied to measure other food, cosmetics, and medical product properties or to understand and sort any complex data. For example, for maintenance, maintenance 
uh, with predictions of um, machine failure or for diagnosis in patient sicknesses. So the application is very broad. Just now we focus uh, with our first customer on ships, which is a worst case scenario um, because of the high variability of each potato, potato uh, type and time in the year, during the year and season. So here is really a challenge and we are pretty confident that we can help here. Moreover, I really still enjoy after years of crushing samples. <laughs> um, yeah, the breaking behavior, the zigzags in curves and the noise is really fun. <laughs> so what we are looking now is for partnerships, for customers. And I know that what helps is to tell future customers that we already had customers. It's what they asked for. Did it work? Uh, who you work with? So this is like what I'm looking for first. The call is very clear. Uh, so this is good. What was your, um, how, where did you enjoy the startup school program? But uh, how did it help you? Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it a lot and it gave me uh, like uh, steps to follow and push a bit because during all the daily work, it's hard sometimes to find the time uh, to think deeply about your business idea and to really go into it. So I learned also a lot um, from the others' experiences, there were several coach, uh, coaches and coaches exchanging their ideas and their problems and how they did it. And in particular, I would like to thank the Carrots team and my coaches, Simon and Andy, for their very good advice uh, for our business idea, business model, how to implement. Uh, and also we discussed uh, several ways to grow and fall and um, this is like um, an up and down process. So I know I'm confident and I will try error, try error, continue. Another thing which, which I really loved is uh, the storytelling workshop because we could um, produce a short advertisement movie, train how to formulate simply uh, what we want to explain to customers or other people. Excellent. Solange, we do wish you the best with crispy AI because that sounds like a very, very good idea and, uh, and proof of concept. Hamet, your um, scattering, your company is actually formed, right? It's been incorporated into a company, so you're slightly more advanced. But tell us all about uh, well, your, your idea, your solutions, your team, and what you're looking for. Hamet, in two minutes, tell us all about scattering. Yes, uh, Solange, could you please uh, close the screen share? So yes, sorry. <laughs> yes okay. thank you. Go ahead, Hamid. Yes, is it visible now? Yes. To everyone. Great. Uh, we are Scatrin, Stockholm-based startup, spun out from research at KTH, Royal Institute of Technology. We have been officially funded. Uh, last July, like you said, like you mentioned. And in scattering, we deal with engineering materials, processes, and components. Scattering helps industry use world's most powerful microscopes and make understanding-driven innovations in materials and processes possible. We need to understand and quantify structural changes in materials during and after production in service. However, inefficient analysis methods and data analysis protocols hinder rapid progress and bringing innovations to market. In scattering, we offer streamlined access to the synchrotron X-ray and neutron facilities to develop, test, and validate products in representative process and service conditions. And we do this in four adjustable steps, starting from defining the problem. For example, our industrial partner may want to know at which state of their process they get the unwanted phase so that they can tune the process if we work together on this and show them when or they may need to understand how the structure of their material evolves during service. 
we then choose the most suitable solution, neutrons, X-rays, or maybe we can solve the problem at lab. We also help with preparations, including sample and sample environment, for example. We perform the measurements, and finally, we do the analysis and interpretation of the data. For specific cases, we can do all four steps within one to three months of period. My name is Ahmed Badr Yildiz. I am the CEO of Sketrin, and our co-founder and CSO is Peter Hestrom. And we will be happy to discuss the possibilities and, of course, the challenges if you reach us. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. Quick question for you first and then to the whole panel. Uh, Hamid, the, you founded your company after you went through the startup school program. Was, how did it help you or did it actually help you? Yeah, it did definitely, we would say. So first of all, we haven't met any scientific service company before. It was the first time we met and so how things can it be if we do it correct? And our coach was Bernhardt and he has mentioned like uh, he wish they had this chance before and we agree. Thanks to coaching and uh, chair startup school, we had a good background, we get the initial kick, and we possibly uh, hinder the mistakes that we might have uh, do during the process and in the near future. So I would say, I think we save some months and probably years of experience thanks to the startup school. And yeah, one more thing is like, it was really in detail. It includes anything that we need from finding customer, being customer and need oriented to also some practicals like cash flow, for example, the things that you don't normally don't think that much in the very beginning. So it was very useful for us. Thank you. And so if any of you in the, in the audience um, are entrepreneur, or if you know of any entrepreneurs who might be interested in the startup school, do reach out to the, to the project team. And uh, you're also very welcome to ask questions to uh, these uh, four uh, presenters in the, through the chat uh, to the Q&A if, uh, if you'd like to. But I, I do have a question for you all. Do you think there is a recipe for success? Uh, for scientific service companies? Is there, uh, or, or do you think that because of the, the speciality or the level of expertise or the area of expertise of these companies, or even the regions they're located in, make the, the coaching, the, the personal coaching essential? But is there um, some ingredients or some recommendations that you can give here? We'd like to go first. Solange, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, for me, one, one thing is uh, always ask the user <laughs> first so you can always profit from their real needs and uh, really uh, offer what helped them and evaluate with them if, if they would uh, buy or not at the end. And um, when it's a B2B um, relationship, as in our case, uh, then we can call even sometimes the CEO of tiny companies because they are all only human. So yeah, train and train and then one step of the, after the other, uh, it will be easier. And this also we discussed uh, with Andy, like being natural and showing and asking. It's not so complicated, but first try it. <laughs> it's this hurdle that you need first to, to cross. Yeah, and <laughs> Take the phone. <laughs> Andy Bernard, would you would you have been able to train any potential or future scientific service company? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, my my experience, I think, of this this school is is that actually there I think there are elements that are very underpinning, and I think that was actually covered well by the Carrot School, and I think this gives people a framework. Uh, but there's certainly regional variations, and even for example. Uh, depending on how you want to start up. So certainly, uh, as there are a lot of academic ties with a lot of the, you know, the CEOs or the new CEOs, 
you know, there are some universities that I think are better at spinning out uh, activities than, than others. And I think this also will depend a bit on the region as to the sort of level of support you can get for such activities. So I think my take home message would be, yes, there are core elements that's particularly covered well by carrots. Um, and I think that there are other aspects, other dimensions, which might mean that there are more opportunities for some, uh, depending on where you are from. Bernard, do you want to come in on that question? Would you, would you have trained any uh, future company? Is there like um, a structure, a program that you can actually apply across the board? Well, I think yes and no. So I think as, as Andrew said, so there are some general things that may apply for all companies. But I think it's good that we were focusing on this scientific service providers that are basically using this large scale research facilities, because I think in the end, it's quite a specific, specific niche and uh, the challenges we have as a scientific service company is also uh, different to, to other startups that uh, have other, let's say, uh, offer offerings. But I think the, well, the most important things and the most, I think the most, yes, the most important message is you have to, you have to try, you have to, um, and then you have to try harder and again and so on. And this is something that may apply for, for all kinds of, of, of startups. Very good. I want to also ask you to the four of you, what do you need to scale up your company or to launch it in the case of Solange? But Finden and Exploration are pretty, already pretty well established, but we, yeah, there are probably some growth uh, prospects. So what do you think a, service, uh, a scientific service company need to scale up beyond the startup school program, because um, we can also look at, at um, your cases, Finden and Exploration. I mean, in, in, in the back of my head, it's we're talking about services here, not a product. So can an SSC become a unicorn one day? Who wants to go? Uh, Andy, I, I go. can start if you like. I think as you highlighted, I mean, as a, as a scientific service provider, we are generally trading on our expertise and therefore we're a bit limited in terms of resource. As you say, we don't have a product that necessarily scales. Um, where we've been able to sort of scale up is that actually, um, well, I think availability of talent is critical here. So in fact, we've almost sort of done it the, the other way around is that we've actually found some high quality talent, employed them, and then they've opened up opportunities. And I think they, what's attractive for them to be part of a company like Finden is that we are an SME, so they get exposure across the board. So they're not just turning a handle, let's say, providing solutions to a scientific problem, but they're also learning about pitching to clients, uh, writing proposals. This is another key thing. Uh, one of the key messages we have in the booklet accompanying these activities is that, you know, registering for uh, national and international funding schemes is critical. And of course, particularly with the European Union, there's a lot of focus on supporting SMEs. So of course, if you look, I think the EU has a statistic that says something like 99% of employees are working on with SMEs. So effectively, it's a, you know, what we're doing now is actually more typical of the working life environment than what say working for big companies like. So I think, you know, for us, uh, scalability it comes with kind of having the expertise, accessible, accessibility to expertise and funding. But I think in order to scale, and in fact, something we're trying to do now, it, we are trying to, you know, productize some of the stuff we're doing. So that could be software, it could be expertise that's translated in, into a product that we can scale. So I think um, that may not be something that works for everybody. We've, we've certainly seen scientific service companies in the past just scale with the amount of provision that uh, they and expertise they can provide across a particular um, uh, I suppose, sector of the business. All right, we heard from Solange what she needs to get started. What about you, Bernardo, Hamet? What do you need to, um, to scale up exploration of Catherine in a very, uh, very short comment, please? Maybe from uh, us. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, please okay. go ahead, Bernardo. Okay, so I think from our perspective, it's um, there's some, some, sometimes on the past there's opportunities and you have to realize that there are actually opportunities and then you you have to grab them and i think this is how we how we scaled i think so there was a chance of of new business opportunities and we took them we tried to 
then um, focus on these new opportunities. And also, uh, same as Andre said, so we hired new staff and they brought in new expertise and so on. I don't think that the scientific service provider will become a unicorn, to be honest, but I think there's room for for growth. And um, in the very beginning, in our first year, we had a discussion with a venture capitalist and he said, basically, there's no way that we will receive money from them because we're providing service and not a product and there's no scalability. I think they are mistaken because I think there is some degree of scalability and there's for sure potential for growth. But um, I think we do it um, our own now on a, on a slow but very steady um, sustainable rate. Hamed, do you want to come in before we conclude? Yes, shortly. So I'm not at a position to give advice, but I can mention what we'll be doing in scattering. So we first started with our, let's say, so-called uh, early adopters and now applying for funding. So which means we are funding dependent and it gives more responsibility for scaling up, let's say. So we will be working on our products and offerings and pricing at the same time working on projects. And also we will have the time to develop our backend, our software product. And then we are hoping there will be right time in the near future to scale up for us as well. Thank you, Hamed. I just have one final question for you, Andy. I think you were mandated by the current project to tell us what's going to be the future of the startup school. So what is it going to be? Uh, well, I think we were all impressed with, you know, the first efforts as far as carrots were concerned. So currently now discussions are ongoing about carrots too. Uh, so we're hopeful that something will be running uh, again next year uh, and one thing I should mention is that a few of us a few of the CEOs from this initiative have now are in the process of setting up a company to help uh, startups get going so sort of administrative headaches you know discussions about IP for example you know we can provide that additional support which I think will accelerate the growth of these or the at least getting going with some of these initiatives and ideas that these very bright, smart people are coming to us to discuss about. Excellent. So we look forward to hearing more about this, uh, this new company and I'm sure we'll have other occasions to, to do so. I'd like to thank you, uh, the four of us, and uh, we will now uh, actually turn to the panel discussion. We will, uh, we will discuss the role of industrial R&D in innovation ecosystems and to let uh, the five speakers, the five next speakers, time uh, to, to join us. Uh, we'll just show you a very short video that is actually a presentation of Exploration, Bernard's uh, company. And then when, when we'll be back, we'll, uh, we'll welcome our five next speakers. So bear with us. We'll see you in just a minute. Thank you. Welcome back, and I'd like, uh, I would like to introduce our five uh, next and last speakers. Um, good morning to all of you. Uh, we are going to talk now about um, the role of industrial R&D in innovation ecosystems. So back to the conference title about innovation cohesion. So I'll start by introducing you and then we'll get uh, right into uh, uh, an interactive debate. So. Um, we are joined now by first Ulla Engelmann, your Acting Director for Network and Governance at DigiGrow European Commission. Another representative from the European Commission is Apostolia Karamadi, your Head of Unit for 
research and innovation actors and research careers at DG Research and Innovation, so also at the European Commission. Anna, you were with us before, but I'll introduce you again. Anna Stenstam, you're the CEO of CR Competence. We're also joined by a representative from a large company, Magnus uh, Freder uh, Fredriksen, uh, your program manager at Alpha Laval, uh, headquartered in Sweden. And finally, Sotiris Kokinos, you're the CEO of FEAC Engineering, and you're joining us from Greece. Again, welcome to the five of you. Um, I'd like actually to, to, uh, to address the first question to you, uh, Ula and Apostolia. We hear more and more about innovation ecosystem. This is not a new notion, but um, there is that feeling that it's rising on the EU uh, policy agenda. Why is that? What, what, what do you think it's, uh, it's important to look at the innovation landscape and innovation capacity through the lens of ecosystems? Ola, do you want to, to start? Okay, I Go can ahead. start. Um, You're coming to with, with, with two different perspectives, so that's why so it would be good to have you both uh, addressing this question. So you're coming from DG Grow, so more from the industrial perspective. Go ahead. Yes, uh, absolutely. And um, we, we have two notions of ecosystem. Uh, we have the um, innovation ecosystems uh, in order to... Um, the, which will be probably more in detail explained by uh, Leah, but uh, we also have industrial ecosystems and uh, we have identified in the latest uh, uh, industrial strategy, 14 industrial ecosystems. And the ecosystem notion has been come up because it was seen that we need to look larger than uh, before where we looked, uh, for example, at uh, strategic value chains. But we really see we need to look at the different parts of an ecosystem. And of course, uh, innovation uh, players are a very important part of the ecosystem. But on the other hand, you need to have this holistic view, meaning you need to look at uh, the different businesses, you need to look at uh, the social partners, you need to look at the innovation actors, but also at public authorities. So that's why uh, the approach uh, is much larger. And uh, also when we did, particularly as a follow-up of the crisis, we did an analysis, the ecosystems were affected by the crisis very differently. And that's why we needed for, and we needed this data, let's say also quite quickly, we couldn't rely on the usual waiting for uh, the effects uh, you get statistical data two years later. So we needed to reach out to the different ecosystem players to get the effect of the crisis, to be able to analyze what's happening in the ecosystem, but then also for the recovery to propose measures, you need to have access to the different ecosystems. So that's uh, from, let's say, the industrial ecosystem uh, approach where I come from and then maybe uh, my colleague Leah would want to complement on the innovation ecosystem. Go ahead Apostolia if you want to to bring uh, the, the, the perspective from DG Research. In fact the definition of ecosystem could keep us busy for a while but, um, uh, but what is your perspective on this? Thank you, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to be here with you today. Good morning, everybody. Um, indeed, uh, from a research and innovation perspective, Europe enjoys a very a high degree of competence and qualification. We have excellent researchers, we have excellent infrastructures, uh, we have a wealth of data and knowledge produced in multiple domains. Um, at the same time, at the same time, we still have many challenges that we need to uh, address. For example, uh, compared to other areas which are uh, very competent in research and innovation, uh, the global investment in research and innovation in, in Europe still needs to reach the 3% uh, target of GDP. Um, we have a heterogeneity uh, in Europe and therefore there is a need to increase access to excellence across the continent. 
Um, we also have many, for example, infrastructures we are not, which are not, whose use is not optimized and whose access needs to be better organized. So these are challenges we need to address within you know, research and innovation. At the same time, um, there is an increased attention to how research can bring solutions to the society and to the economy and how we can bridge research to uh, the single market and in the industrial strategy presented by Ula earlier on. We know that growth comes uh, at ecosystem level. We, we need to promote place-based growth and therefore addressing issues only from the top down is not good enough. We need to be able to promote measures that can support place-based growth and therefore the ecosystem level. An ecosystem can have a very broad definition. An uh, ecosystem is um, includes a network of actors that interact together and get, they can actually promote um, value creation, they can promote growth, as they can promote skilling of the society and so on, depending on the objectives. In the case of innovation, of course, we're looking into bringing results from research into the economy, bridging between research and uh, uh, industrial uh, policies, uh, um, if you wish. And this has occupied uh, greatly the ongoing uh, policy discussions on the new Euro European research area and how it can support innovation and the attention to the ecosystem level has been brought to the fourth again. Of course, it's not a new concept, but with a new, a more improved approach and methodology, maybe. Um, in other words, many initiatives have been out there, especially funded by the framework programs. But the question is how we can join forces with member states, regional actors, um, in order to have a more structured and more widespread approach to ecosystems. Uh, the notion of ERA hubs, European Research Area, area hubs, has been promoted. Um, aiming at expanding best practices across the EU and reinforcing the ecosystem so as to increase opportunities for the local actors. So indeed, just to confirm that on, from the research innovation side, better linking to smart specialization strategies, better linking to the ecosystem level is of top priority if we want to bring the results closer to the society and the economy. The economy. Thank you. Uh, it's, you've both raised a very important point and one thing I heard is actually uh, the, the fact that the innovation ecosystem lens uh, allows to identify several types of stakeholders. So broadening the question to, um, to all of you, that w why does it matter? Like um, Anna and Sotiris, you're both representative of scientific service companies. Do you, um, what's your feeling? Do you feel like your type of SME has the recognition it needs to strive. <laughs> and I think you need to take this one. <laughs> it is getting better. Okay. Is my response to this. It is definitely getting better. And I'm really happy to hear how ecosystems and networks are, are um, looked upon now. Because I think that if you are a little bit of a nerdy physics chemistry person like myself, you know that interface is all about surface area volume uh, relations. And the more smaller actors you have, the larger the interface will be and the better the connections will be. So it's important to see the ecosystem having these big building blocks, but also the mortar between them. And that's where I think companies like Sotiris and mine uh, really comes in. It is uh, flexible, smart, fast moving companies and people who can adapt to these type of uh, changes, like, like you mentioned, the crisis and so forth. Um, I think that is extremely important and that is why I'm, I'm glad that we are more recognized. But no, it's not recognized enough. I think um, I come from a, com from a country where there is a bit of a dualistic approach to this, um, where on one side, uh, companies and entrepreneurship like ours is, is, uh, is valued and uh, talked a lot about and appreciated in many ways. But at the same time, large funds and structures are, are promoting uh, larger, uh, more state-owned uh, infrastructures. And I think uh, it's interesting and important to look at it also in countries like, like mine, which uh, sometimes are, are brought up as an, an example of uh, a good example. So 
I, I think it is very important. I think also someone said earlier today that we might not be unicorns uh, now or, or in the future. But I think that we are catalysts. We're definitely helping others to become unicorns. And I have no idea how the European Commission or anyone else are going to measure and follow this, but it's important to do so. It is very important to measure what goes on with the companies that we work with and not only with us as uh, uh, closed and isolated entities. So I'm happy to contribute to, uh, to what the European Commission is doing when it comes to analyzing this. I think it is very, very important. Thank you, Anna. So not unicorn, but catalyst. I think that helps us uh, grab better what the scientific service companies are. Magnus, can I stay with you? The Swedish ecosystem is, well, uh, we'll hear about the Greek ecosystem afterwards, but did, did you agree with what you've heard so far? Do you, have, um, do, do you feel like Alpha Laval belongs to an ecosystem? Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, Regarding the ecosystems, I think um, we have a lot of ambition here, both from uh, startup companies, uh, service companies, and also the LSIs and so on. But today, I think uh, the whole system is a little bit quite unmature because uh, we are trying to get uh, better and better. And we, we don't really look into the perspective to be different. I think we need to find another solution or another structure here to, to get this going and to scale. And uh, there are a lot of efforts in, uh, in Sweden. And Anna, you know about this as well. And uh, it's a lot of focus on the funding uh, from uh, state money and so on. But still, I guess uh, we need to come up with another approach here to get more drive from the large companies and also from the SMEs. And in that perspective, we all we definitely need um, scientific service providers to get or to fill the gap between the need from the industry and also from uh, the offering that those LSIs can provide. But Magnus, is it in Alpha Laval's corporate culture to utilize these uh, well, services of, well, of research infrastructures or intermediary companies, those scientific service companies? Do you do that? I would say that uh, uh, Alpha Laval is a typical uh, engineering company with a lot of uh, product development and great ideas and a lot of patents and so on. We are curious we are interested in new technologies so uh, but again we need to find the way how to work and how to utilize those opportunities that are coming up here and uh, working with lsis it's for us a, in a more pragmatic way it's it's uh, kind of new we have done some experiments we are trying to learn how to benefit from the lsis you know, we have Max4 and ESS just next door here. So um, so for us, uh, we need to develop a new way of working and uh, have come up with a new, uh, I would say, approach. Because, again, we are a company and we are looking for the value of using uh, uh, LSIs. And as long as that we cannot find a solid business model, it's, it's really hard to motivate. But we are trying hard and we have the ambition to be more um, engaged in working with LSIs and, of course, uh, service, uh, scientific service companies or, or providers. All right. There, I see there are uh, a few questions starting to come in in the in the Q and A function uh, next to the to the live you're watching. So just keep sending them. Okay. I will I will take a few uh, at uh, uh, in just a, a, a short time. Uh, be, but before I do so, it's it's you've raised an interesting point, Magnus. It's actually a bit of a reality check as well. The use of scientific service companies is not yet well spread. So what what can be done to better integrate uh, such companies, the added value in large companies' value chains? 
what can be done? So Thierry, you haven't yet come in. What's, uh, wh what is it in your experience? But uh, it, it's a question for you all. Uh, here it's, it's well, clearly a change mm -hmm. of culture that needs to happen. Well, uh, if I may comment on from my side uh, in Greece, it's getting better, not as much as we would like, but it's getting better. Uh, we begin getting receiving the recognition as mentioned before, but again, every time uh, we need to spend a lot of effort in order to make our clients or potential clients to understand what we provide, what would be the, the advantages of uh, trusting us on providing our services. Every time it needs a lot of time in order to come to a final decision from their side. Uh, in the previous years in Greece, there was a huge financial crisis. A lot of lessons were learned from the big companies. There are not many big companies in Greece. We are not having so much big industry, but again, there are some very uh, well known in the European uh, market. We try to approach them. Uh, they also learned that uh, they need to, to trust SMEs like us, to trust companies that provide uh, high added uh, engineering services and the scientific services because they are the companies that provide them the innovation. They will help them to come to the forefront of the innovation and finally to the competition of the global market. Uh, for, from us, for us here based here in Greece, the difficulties are, uh, I would say, a little bit more uh, in, in number. And what I mean on that it means that being based on the southeast part of Europe, we need to be close to the European market. So that means that we, love, that we need to invest money on participating on uh, exhibitions taking place or conferences taking place in the Europe. While when being here in Greece, as I said, we need a lot of effort to convince the, convince the companies uh, to trust us. Um, saying that, I, a final comment just to sum it up, it is difficult to make people understand what we provide, but at the end of the day, only through companies like us, like uh, Anna's company, will be able to reach the technology and the innovation market, the increase of the technology and the innovation. All right, so it sounds to me like well, both your companies and Anna's are somehow still suffering from a lack of visibility. Uh, you may disagree, and if you do, uh, it's now the time to say it. Uh, but I, I, I do have a question about wh what to do about this lack of visibility. So broadening um, the, the, the question, uh, it's, do, do, you, do you think that having a policy framework for around innovation ecosystems <coughs> could help and it could be a policy framework that is either at regional, national, or European level. But th does that help at all, or do you think this is some uh, the, this um, uh, this bridge between large companies and research infrastructures need to uh, just to, to be a bottom-up approach? Uh, I, I have two perspectives on this. I think I, I think I believe very much in the, the, the fact that I am not visible enough is my it's on me. I mean, if I want to have clients, I need to sell. So I think I need <laughs> it's, it's quite simple in a way. It's it's selling and, and delivering and, you know, getting recognition based on that. So I think in, in one way, this is up to us very much. And uh, I think if I don't have Swedish clients, then I can go to another country. It, it doesn't have to be here close to me. I don't have to work with European countries. Sorry about the European Commission, but I don't have to. Uh, so I think that's, you know, it's very much in on our own hands. And I think a lot of us are doing a lot and, and we're doing quite well, you know, right? I mean, really, <laughs> we're doing really good, some of us. But yes, I do believe it's important to have a good framework where this is recognized, where we are asked about our opinions about new structures so that you know not mistakes are done that would really really hindering other people other new companies entering this market because there are two perspectives i'm doing fine because i've been doing this for 16 years i have clients i have testimonials 
But if I would start a company now, that then I would look about what what is what is going on. What are the big frameworks? Are these type of companies are they are they wanted, or are the governments doing something else to sort of make this challenging? And I think that is what is important. It's important to to look to have these frameworks and and to include our type of companies so that we can come in with our experiences from different type of, of uh, interfaces and, and provide what is our experience of best practices. But then, Anna, so. we, we, yeah. we, in your own experience, has um, the government framework helped of been challenging for you? If you're saying that you may go and work with customers elsewhere. Well, I, I'm actually quite proud. We have never had any soft, so-called soft money. All the money that we have gotten in is because clients have paid us for our work. So in that way, I am quite separate from what is going on uh, in terms of that. For a couple of years, we were quite badly affected because uh, the uh, Swedish government gave less money to the Institute and then the Institute had to be a little bit more aggressive in its sales. And then the Institute uh, started to uh, be a, a, an unfair competitor, I would say. Now that has changed again, uh, because these things change with the governments and, and everything else. And uh, it's not that I am afraid of, of competition, uh, not at all. I just think that it should be fair. So in Sweden, yes, there have been some challenges. Uh, I personally and my company has not been so much affected, uh, but we are looking out for what's going on and uh, we are trying to defend our market, definitely. What about the others? Do you want to react to? Um, from yes, my please. side, just, I, I agree with Anna. The opportunities are out there and it's up to us to, to find them. Uh, regarding the framework, it is likely now the time that finally at Greece takes place a framework called uh, Greece Industry 4.0. It took maybe, maybe in the rest of the Europe, you are already familiar with Industry 4 and all that stuff. In Greece, we are a little bit uh, back, but now at least finally we have now a, a national framework. It's called Greece Industry Forum. Then they asked for our opinion. They they are waiting for our contribution. So I think that regarding the Greek market, it is up to us now to find the right opportunity and the right um, way out to the market. Apostolia, hola. How does that sound to you? A bit of a reality check for you, uh, seen from Brussels. Yes. <laughs> so first of all, uh, thank you very much for all these inputs. I mean, I, I didn't mention it before, but of course, uh, for us, this is an opportunity to gather the views of the stakeholders and we take them very seriously. Uh, because we are here to offer services to the citizens and companies, for example, in this case, uh, rather than the opposite. Um, <coughs> I wanted to clarify that the policy framework includes funding and investment, and this is very important. Nonetheless, experience and evidence has shown that investment on its own is not enough if it doesn't come with the right framework conditions and the right practices in place. With that, I don't mean a, a very interventionist approach, but rather um, what we're used to doing in Europe, which is joining forces to exchange best practices, identify good patterns, and try to expand this across Europe. I think the example just mentioned uh, by Sotiris is, is a good example of um, using a best practice or in a policy initiative, for example, at European level and seeing how this can be adapted to the national reality and even the regional reality. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that, as I said that, as I said before, we are convinced that growth is stimulated first and foremost uh, at the ecosystem level. So the place-based growth and addressing the regional or the national market is, of course, a priority. Of course, this does not prevent uh, even European level services, for example, of course, but nonetheless, most companies are concerned by this uh, by this market. So this is something that, of course, is uh, we, we do understand and uh, and promote. Um, uh, some measures, some policy measures, sometimes they are so well intertwined in the national or regional ecosystem that even they, they are taken for granted, uh, such as, for example, the single market or um, what I was saying before, exchanging best practices, bringing 
changing policies from national levels to European levels or the other way around. So I think the most successful policy framework is that, that the, where different um, um, policy frameworks work together in Europe. This is Europe after all, um, through the exchange of best practices, understanding, mapping the best practices, modeling them, and then uh, trying to expand these, of course, on a best effort basis across Europe for the benefit of companies and citizens. I think this is the approach that we're trying to promote. And of course, it is not, um, it is not uh, trivial and easy uh, to be able to um, combine this top-down, bottom-up approach of so the ecosystem level where the real growth is and um, trying to, to see how the policy frameworks can actually offer and facilitate, rather facilitate this, uh, this ecosystem. So this is an ongoing effort that we have on our side and this kind of exchanges and dialogues is very enriching indeed. Ulla, from what you heard today, um, do you identify best practices that you had in mind until today? I think um, one of the best practices to be used, but which is also part of a policy framework, uh, are existing networks. Because um, it, it was very much uh, said that uh, you need to have the links. Uh, funding on its own won't, won't help. You need to have uh, the right connections. You need to find yourself in the right environment. And uh, for this, uh, there are different kinds of networks uh, which are particularly in Europe there to help SMEs. So on one hand, we have the Enterprise uh, Europe network, which is there to provide services to SMEs. So I think as you are, let's say, scientific service provider, my advice would be see who is your local EN hub, connect with them, and uh, or maybe you are connected, and make it clear to them that, that you are also kind of service. And as they are providing services to others, then you, let's say, figure on their service menu. Another uh, area are industrial but, clusters. Ula, sorry, I need to, to challenge you on this. So if, um, uh, so when it, Magnus, you can come, hin, come in here. If you're a large company, do you go to that kind of uh, European enterprise network if you, if you have a specific need in terms of measurement? Yeah, of course. All right, and have you? Okay. Uh, but that's so, a, but it's that's more for one. SMEs. No, the, the EN is is mainly for SMEs, but there are other business organizations who also have more reach out to the larger companies like industrial cluster. And this was the second one I was coming to Go because ahead. it depends very <laughs> much which network you have to uh, use. There, there are different networks, and but also we hope that these networks we are forcing to work more and more in synergies. Uh, so uh, I think using industrial uh, clusters and uh, also, for example, in, in Greece, we, we know there uh, are some very strong clusters, who, but who still are evolving and, and, and reaching out to, to companies. And I would also be very interested whether you are in contact with these industrial clusters and how were your experience, uh, same for Sweden, of course. So, because uh, for us, this is also, as you said, a, a reality check. And then just one last point, because uh, we talked about the single market and the single market for, for goods we know is working quite well. Of course, there were interruptions uh, due to the crisis, but the single market for services, we are looking into what are barriers, what can be made better. So this kind of experience is also very helpful in view of improving the single market for services. But the Carrots project is offering yet another network. So is it just a multiplication of, uh, of networks? Should they, should, should, should they just capitalize on existing network? What is your recommendation here, Ola? They should link with a network because as it is very specific, uh, they should link with a network, they should bridge to the network. And particularly, as it was said, you are catalyst, you are translating uh, the needs of SMEs. So um, I think uh, the best thing is to, to, to hook up and to, to become uh, part of, of bigger networks or that the networks reach out to you. So I think 
it's a way of, of connecting. And uh, if we look at, particularly now for the recovery, we need uh, to, to do our utmost uh, to have access to technologies, to infrastructure, to use our infrastructures. So I think we, we can't have enough of trying to, to foster it uh, and uh, for our European competitiveness. And so that's why I think it's important. Sonia. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so indeed, in addition to what uh, to what Ulla just explained, so I, I would like to make the distinction between existing networks uh, that aim uh, at providing the services that Ulla just explained and basically connecting, and also networks which may have to be um, implemented spontaneously, taking into account the scientific knowledge that needs to be uh, created, circulated, or used. Um, uh, for example, uh, we see that very often in the context of technology or research infrastructures, uh, data uh, may be created by a given infrastructure uh, or multiple infrastructures and maybe for the needs of a specific service, um, we need to network different type of entities or actors or accessing data from different sources. And therefore, there we have a network which has science at its base. So speaking from a research innovation perspective. So, one, so my message is one does not prevent the other. On the contrary, they're complementary. Good. I have a question for you, Anna, and, and Sotiris from the audience. I'm going to read it out. Is the use of state-of-the-art tools an issue, specifically for X-ray and photon sources? I assume these are located at universities or research centers. Is the use then distorting the market? as Beamline is limited and can only be made available for a small fraction of the total time. Do you know how well, to address this question? Please, Anna, yes. <laughs> OK. Go ahead. Um, I, well, there were many questions in one, I yes. think. Yes. Uh, but I mean, to my experience, a lot of these things are not used 24-7. Some, yes, are more, more complicated to, uh, to, uh, to reach than others, but then there are many places to reach them at. Uh, as I said in the previous presentation, we are very much problem solvers. So, the, so, so that has not been an issue for, for our companies. Um, we find these, uh, the techniques that we need to use and, and use them. And um, the, the instruments that my company uses, definitely not a pr problem. I mean, with a couple of weeks of planning, that's, that's not a problem. Uh, so what's that question? Is that, it, it's not, a, I mean, the, the advanced technologies are in our favor. They provide data that could not be provided in any other way. And that means that they are pieces to a puzzle that could be quite unique and in sometimes being pivotal for, for the problems being solved. Well, in our case, uh, in our company, our main uh, issue are the, the software licenses and the HPC infrastructure. In terms of licenses, it's up to us to find the budget and uh, to purchase the licenses uh, for one or more years. On the other hand, when we are in need of bigger HPC infrastructure, that's a, a a pain for us because in Greece, until now at least, we weren't able to use the infrastructure provided by the government. It was only available for the academia and the research community, and not for the industrial companies. Uh, this is something that now is under discussion in order to change. Uh, but uh, this affected a little bit uh, our uh, job because we had to find uh, other solutions in order to to be to find uh, access to HPC infrastructure. Mm. All right. Uh, so I want to go to another to another topic now: the profile of researcher entrepreneurs, and uh, and also to touch upon uh, the the career prospect for researchers. Uh, we know that the reality isn't um, always very bright uh, for careers around Europe when we talk about research, um, about careers prospects. So from what you've heard so far or from your own experience, do you think these uh, intermediary players that are actually uh, between large companies and the world of science can become 
or can be a source of stability for researchers and provide better prospects for the future? Who wants definitely. To Go ahead, Anna. I want to start. I definitely think so. That's why I think that we are we, we are a type of, of market and company of our own. And uh, this is, it is not easy to do what we're doing, but it's, there are a lot of people like us who are good scientists, engineers, problem solvers, but all also appreciate this way of working. Um, you don't have to be an entrepreneur and not everybody has to start the company. But uh, you need to be very, very custom uh, service uh, focused and have some other skills also in communication and so forth. So definitely, this is an interesting uh, work career possibility. And just this month, we have hired two new uh, team members, one from from France and one from Hungary. Congratulations. Uh, and I think we are a team of 10 people from most places in Europe, so it looks like now. So I think, yes, this is definitely a, a fantastic opportunity for many of us. And uh, we need also these language skills and, and perspectives and not having everybody schooled by the same professors. So uh, that is also extremely important that, uh, that we come from all over. Uh, I fully agree with Anna and nothing else to add. She, she covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just, I, I, maybe then I can add something to myself. Because in our company, there are several career paths. You can continue in, in the technology path and become better and better at, for example, small angle X-ray scattering. But you can also become uh, better and better at project management, still having the engineering or scientific base. And you can become better and better at sales and in the key account management and, and expectation management. So there are different ways of developing also in, in, a, in a company like ours. And I think that is very interesting. And that gives people an opportunity to try something new, but still in a relatively safe haven of uh, their competence base. How does that sound to you, Apostolia and Ula? Apostolia, you're in, you're in charge of uh, research careers and uh, did your research. So how does, uh, does that inspire you? I, I, I find this very inspiring. I'm very pleased to listen to these reactions because this is at the heart of the current policy discussions. And um, seeing, that, uh, seeing this positive feedback is quite encouraging for us. So indeed, um, the challenge uh, faced, the precarity challenge faced by researchers as, uh, as part of the highly skilled workers in the, in the labor market is, is very important. Part of the problem is that uh, many of them have expectations to continue their career within academia. And what needs to be, be better promoted and valorized is actually uh, intersectoral mobility, moving towards industry, towards existing companies, and going up to value creation. But as you said, Anna, this is not compulsory. Still, in our radio screen, you see the full, we see the full spectrum of the activities. This, of course, presupposes, uh, pre so presupposes that um, researchers are properly skilled already within academia in order to optimize, uh, let's say, their perspectives and better reap the opportunities. And therefore, um, doctoral training, for example, should also address skilling such as entrepreneurial skilling, the digital skills, the project management skills, uh, broader research management skills, let's say, so that they can be better adapted in a company environment beyond the academic environment. This is very important. It also presupposes increased cooperation between academia and the ecosystem the, the local companies or industry, for example, in order to have exchange and uh, provide the possibility for um, this kind of rotation of researchers. So as companies to test and also researchers to test other career opportunities. So we're looking into these types of solutions uh, for the future. And I'm, I'm very pleased and eager to listen more to this type of feedback and practical solutions that we can put in place in order to promote, uh, to promote this kind of uh, perspective. Um, we also see a win-win situation because, uh, and of course, people are at the center of service provision, especially when it comes to scientific service provision. And the, one of the keys to a successful company is also the right uh, personnel. And of course, researchers uh, probably are the best profile, let's say, to at least to meet some of the tasks uh, and the objectives of the of the company. So uh, very, very pleased to be part of this uh, discussion. And thank you very much.
Magnus, can I come to you actually? How does that resonate with you? Because we, we speak about academic researchers, but we could also um, speak about private researchers in the private sector here. Mm -hmm. I think in, in uh, this should be balanced in some way because uh, the top notch uh, research here will come from the academia in, in the beginning, but when it comes more applied, uh, we can uh, use the research front in the industry. And in a short term, I think uh, uh, providers uh, are necessary, but in a long term, looking at the bigger companies, I think we will, would like to have this competence inside or in-house. So, um, But this is not a good news for scientific service companies. It depends on they would <laughs> like to change <laughs> jobs. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Uh, again, it's it's this is about the balance when you are when you are designing your offering. It's it's um, it's a normal business and operations development here. So I think the scientific service companies or providers they need to find their market, and uh, for uh, SMEs I think that will be a a good market, but for larger companies, uh, I th guess, I don't know, but I, th I think in, in the end, we would like to have this inside and we can uh, provide uh, uh, the service ourselves. Okay. But um, that's a guess. I don't know wh what the future will say, but uh, in short term, I think uh, the uh, scientific service providers are really important to get things going and to get things to scale. Anna. A comment and a highlight. Go ahead. Uh, the comment is uh, that uh, we almost only work with big global companies of the size of Alfa Laval or larger. So uh, it does not have to be like that. Uh, and they very often have the competence themselves, but they need peers and they need to do more. So that's one, one side of it. It doesn't always have to be like that, but for us it is. My highlight is, you're absolutely right, Magnus, we need to be at the really state of the art front, because many companies will have their own competence and their own uh, um, yeah, expertise in the area. And that's something I would like now to say to, to Ulla and uh, Apostolia. One important thing that has been a problem for many of us is to how to keep being at that front, because as in, at least in Sweden, we are not affiliated to the university, so we cannot apply for doing, you know, advanced uh, academic research for our own benefit, which is the best way of learning. And we have, are not patent based, so we have not been able to, to apply for funds to do that either. So it is really a challenge to, to when you're as educated and as experienced as we are, we are the experts, we are really the ones giving the classes. So how are we going to stay there, stay there at the edge. University uh, academics, they are staying there because they're doing more and more science. They have PhD students and so forth. So this is, I think, a very important challenge. We can get started, but how do we stay relevant? And I think we all have our different solutions to that, but I think it's a, it's a topic of, of, of absolute high importance and, and uh, because it's one thing to establish all these companies, but we have to stay relevant. And um, how, how, do we, how do we get to do that? How do we get these type of, of uh, situations where we continue to learn? Of course, one thing is to uh, employ new and uh, newly educated uh, scientists, but uh, I hope there would be many other ways of looking at this as well. So I let you all um, um, respond or comment to what, uh, what we just heard from Anna. But on top of that, I had a, a question that just came in, or that came uh, a few minutes ago from the audience. And the question is for Ula and Apostolia. So um, what about uh, the ecosystem of EU program? We have in size regional programs, Horizon Europe, and the resilience uh, program supported by NextGen EU, knowledge uh, ecosystems, uh, the, uh, the uh, well, research and innovation ecosystems, and we now have to get to uh, a full recording in progress. Uh, isn't that too complex for the startups to find their way? Did she just disappear? 
I think yeah. so. <laughs> yes, I yeah. can't hear You must get this question. So you can time. comment on my question, on my thing then. Um, Who wants to go first? Yes, with pleasure, although I don't have the perfect solution. So the first thing I wanted to say, Anna, that of course you know this much better than me, the market is dynamic. Uh, everything evolves, uh, including companies, including all actors, actually. And therefore, um, staying relevant means also writing, uh, following the right path of the evolution, whatever this may mean, uh, in relation to bigger companies, for example, in, in relation to expanding expertise in terms of skilled work force or in terms of uh, uh, new market segments that you may want to achieve. So this is one dimension, which of course is market, completely market driven. What we see from the policy dimension is the need to bring the ecosystem actors together. For example, just to say mm -hmm. a specific point, on the specific point you raise, where we are currently very much involved in the um, on the European strategy for universities, and universities have multiple missions. It's not just the education mission; it's also the research, innovation, and also service to society mission. Mm -hmm. And more and more, we see universities very much engaged into the interaction with the different ecosystem act actors and having an interdependency um, to exchange uh, personnel and staff, to uh, exchange knowledge for value creation for services and so on. So um, let's say that the, the frontiers are not clear cut, but rather there is a trend for more integration uh, between the actors of the ecosystem. And I think this can also help because it, it mm. puts everybody at the right place. Yeah, sounds very good. Ulla, do you want to come in? I'm sorry, because I, I, I couldn't hear some of what you just said, Apostolia, and I don't know if the audience could, uh, but I'll, I'll let um, uh, Ulla, go on, carry on. Okay, so yeah, from, uh, from my perspective also, uh, I think we, we need also uh, to have, let's say, a stronger opening from university towards the demand side, in the sense uh, having more interactions between university and business and uh, thinking of, uh, and what you, what you mentioned, Anna, is, is also particularly on the upskilling, because uh, that is also what we have seen in the European skills agenda. There it's also re and upskilling, but uh, that for this, we need to find uh, European partnerships um, where companies ca can work together uh, to bundle, let's say, also opportunities uh, because we will have in many areas uh, high demands uh, in, on, on re- and upskilling. And if you now look at your part, because their upskilling is more relevant, uh, which means then you would need to have this contact between universities and companies in order to foster this um, upskilling. And this upskilling could then also, for example, be supported by public authorities, because when you then, you also talked before on the uh, researcher's career, that is then also incentives to, to keep people in, uh, in, in, in the research uh, careers. And uh, this is something we are looking in and uh, also be part of, because there was also the question on how do we link the different programs together. And uh, there, for example, there is this discussion between how can we use Horizon, but it's, it's, it's also, let's see, uh, all the uh, social part which comes in because the skilling, this needs to be combined. Uh, and uh, for that uh, one way we are tackling is what we call transition pathways uh, for the transition of uh, our ecosystems. And there we really want to bring the different player together, look at different scenarios and analyze different options. But this opens a whole other uh, set of discussion. And I think we are, we are already at the end of uh, We this, are at so the end of this, of this panel discussion. Why, this is one of the way how we are looking at, at synergies. And I also must excuse myself because I have to be at 12 o'clock in the next this meeting. This is fine. So. Thank you. Thank you very much to the five of you. And I think there will be more discussions uh, going on offline uh, further to this panel discussion. So again, a very warm, uh, well, a very warm thank you uh, to the five of you. You've raised a lot of very important points here. Uh, I think it's an invitation to carry on this discussion. Uh, 
in whatever setting. But I'll let you go, Ula. I know you have another meeting, so very grateful that you could join us uh, today and same to the, uh, to the four of others. And this is actually the conclusion uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this live. Uh, but don't uh, go because there is uh, a networking session. Uh, the Carrots team have tried to put together uh, this uh, to, to organize the, net, the, the networking bit in a way where you can uh, interact with each other uh, around specific topics. And I will read out uh, what the, this, these three topics so that you can find your way. Uh, so there is uh, one uh, networking session that will focus on how to foster new scientific service companies through knowledge transfer and being part of a network. All right, so you'd be able to hear more about the Startup School and the Mixen Network if you're interested in that bit. Then there is a second room uh, that is about the potential of this emerging market and key factors in setting up a scientific service company. And finally, there's a third room that's, um, that, um, that's in, uh, where you'd be able to have a conversation about large scale uh, research infrastructure. So you just have to go back to the timeline and there you have access to the three rooms. Uh, just go ahead and uh, enjoy a bit longer the, 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 the company of this Carrots project team. For me, it's, I just want to thank you all again and to thank all the speakers who did a great job. I'd like to thank my colleagues here uh, who are with me in the studio and thank the Carrots uh, team as well. Uh, there's a lot that's, uh, that would be uh, communicated about the, the carrot project is the month uh, ahead. So uh, just stay tuned and keep an eye on the, on the future development. Again, a big thank you to all of you and uh, uh, well, I wish you well. Goodbye. <laughs>